All right, and welcome to the review session here. Uh, so before we kind of get into any questions that you might have, let me just take a minute and just kind of overview what the exam will be on Friday. And then we can talk about questions and do some example problems and things. So in total, the exam will be 22 questions. 16 of those questions will be multiple choice. The other six will either be short answer or fill in the blank or calculation questions. Um, of the categories, like I said before, um, chapter four for nomenclature, chapter seven for equation balancing, equation types, stoichiometry, limiting reactants, yields, um, that's just a little bit more than one third of the exam. The majority of the exam is stuff out of chapter eight, just because chapter eight was just so gosh darn long. Uh, so in here, you're going to find questions like some of the things that you were asked to do on the quiz yesterday. Calculating concentration from raw materials calculating and converting between molarity and mass percent, being able to do, do dilutions, knowing how to identify strong electrolytes, weak electrolytes, non-electrolytes, strong acids, strong bases, soluble salts, and the like. Knowing your simple Bronsted theory, which was one of the quiz questions, um, which actually most of you did pretty well with. And then being able to identify redox reactions, being able to assign oxidation numbers, being able to do net ionic equations, being able to do calculations in solutions. Now, as always, you will be given this equation sheet. Although I will kind of say this equation sheet isn't going to be the most useful thing on Friday since really only this equation here, the titration equation, is actually relevant to the material. Um, everything else on here pertains to something else. but you will be given the equation sheet. You will be given a periodic table, just like you always are. So with that all being said, let's kind of start off the question and answer session here. What are some specific things that you want to talk about here today um, that we can kind of help straighten out for you? Okay, on the practice test. Sure. Okay. Oh, in the, this one. Okay. So this question is very similar to the kinds of questions that um, gave the majority of you the most problem on, on the uh, quiz yesterday. Now, where you get the most confused happens to be usually in the execution of what these terms mean and how to go from one to the other. If you remember at the time, I told you the easiest way to solve this problem was to basically treat it like it was two problems. So if I'm starting with a concentration of two molar hydrochloric, I have to understand that means that there are two moles of HCl for every one liter of solution. Now to turn this into mass percent, I'm gonna need grams of hydrochloric acid and grams of solution. Now, it is true that with the information that I'm given, I could do this all in a series of conversions. 
do dimensional analysis and, and, and have it work. But I've found over the years that that tends not to be how your brains work. And we end up getting more lost than we need to be. The reality is, these are two very simple conversions that we need to do. We just have to know how to do them. So the first conversion, can I take two moles of HCl and turn it into grams of HCl? I would hope so at this point. All we need to do this conversion is the molar mass of HCl. Hydrogen's 1.01, chlorine's 35.45. So the molar mass is 36.46 grams. And if I multiply that by two, I would get 72.92 grams of HCl. So there's the numerator of my final fraction, 72.92 grams of HCl in however many grams of solution. Haven't figured that part out yet. The other part deals with this one liter of solution. I need to turn the one liter of solution into grams of solution. Now there's one piece of information we haven't used yet and that's the density. The density gives us the relationship between the volume of the solution and its mass. So if I recognize that every liter of solution is going to have a thousand milliliters in it, then one milliliter of solution should weigh 1.16 grams. And so if I do the math here, 1,000 times 1 1.16 would be 1,160 grams of solution. So I've taken this solution to molar and I've converted it into mass terms grams of the solute in the numerator, grams of solution in the denominator. The only thing I'm missing is if I were to do this calculation, it would not be a percent. It would be a fraction because we haven't multiplied by 100% yet. So I need to take care of that little piece there. And if I do that calculation, 72.92 divided by 1160, times 100% to three significant figures, I get 6.29% HCl. And really that's all that there is to it. Now in the practice test key, it's probably going to show it the other way. Actually it shows it exactly the same way. Um, it also shows it here in the dimensional analysis form. So you could do this with dimensional analysis. Um, but again, I generally am not re recommending it anymore, mainly because it tends to trip you up more than it helps you.
but certainly the the easier way to go about it is the way that um, we just discussed. Any questions still with this this one? Do we want another example? Okay. Let's try going the opposite direction. Because really, if you can do it in one direction, you can do it the other direction. It's the same logic, just applied in a different way. And honestly, to learn how to do a problem multiple ways actually shows a better understanding of the concept. So we don't want to just practice the same way over and over and over again. Changing the format slightly is going to help us in the long run. So let's, let's pick a solution. Um, I've got a 5.00% solution of barium chloride. I want to turn it into molarity. The density of this solution, again, I'm making this up as we go along here. We're going to say it's 1.07 grams per milliliter. Now, there are a lot of approaches that we could use for this to go about getting to this level. The easiest approach is if I understand that grant, that percent means per 100, then this becomes really easy. It's five grams of barium chloride in 100 grams of solution. Now, like I said, there are other ways to approach it. One of the nice things about percentages is that so long as the numbers work out, you can start really anywhere. If I wanted to do this per one gram of solution, I could. All I would need to do is adjust my grams appropriately, and I could do that by just figuring out what they are using the percent by mass formula. But Starting from the definition standpoint tends to be kind of the easiest approach because we don't have to do any extra calculations. We just use the number as it is. So from that standpoint, to get to molarity, I need to turn this into moles of barium chloride divided by liters of solution. And again, it's going to be pretty much the same two-step process, just in reverse. I have grams of barium chloride. I'm going to need to turn them into moles. Molar mass will do that pretty easily. I have grams of solution. I need to turn it into liters. Density is going to be the way that I can go between the two. Now it's just about doing the work. So I have five grams of barium chloride. Molar mass of barium is 137.33 plus two chlorines at 35.45 each. Total mass, 208.23 grams 
in every mole. So five divided by 208.23 would give me to three significant figures 0 0.0240 moles of barium chloride. For the 100 grams of solution, again, I'm going to use the density. Density says that 1.07 grams are equivalent to one milliliter. Now, depending upon how comfortable I am sliding the decimal, I could stop the conversion here, turn it to milliliters, slide the decimal over three places to the left to get it to liters. I could do that. That would be just fine. If that's not something that you're as comfortable with, again, we can do the one extra conversion to turn the milliliters into liters by dividing by 1,000. So 100 divided by 1.07 divided by 1,000 to three significant figures again. 0.0935 liters. Since molarity is just moles over liters, there is no other thing to multiply by. I can do the calculation directly now. 0 0.0240 divided by 0 0.0935 two, three significant figures, it is 0.257 molar barium chloride. So even if we were asked to go the other way, it's still a two-step calculation. It's still a two-step process. All that we're doing is changing the process to give us the numerator and the denominator. But the, the way to do it is exactly the same. Split it into parts, calculate each part individually, and then bring it back together at the very end. But you have to know your definitions. You have to know what molarity is. You have to know what mass percent is. Without that knowledge, it's difficult. Right. Any, any questions here? All right. Open it up again. Any other specific items that you want to talk about? Hope. Okay, so let's go back to the practice test. Okay, so what we have to remember about assigning oxidation numbers are those few guidelines that we had. We have to remember that the sum of the oxidation numbers is equal to the charge. And we have to remember that oxygen is usually negative two. Hydrogen is either plus or minus one. Fluorine is negative one. So 
those are the kind of key guidelines for oxidation numbers. And from those guidelines, we can kind of figure out everything else. So since we do not have on this side of the equation, any elements, then we know that the oxygen here is gonna be negative two and that the oxygen here is also going to be negative two. Why? Because oxygen is always negative two unless it is in its elemental state. So if I'm looking at carbon monoxide, knowing that oxygen is negative two and that the whole thing is neutral, then the only logical pathway is that the carbon has to be positive too to balance it. Now, if you need to prove that to yourself, you can always do one of these algebra problems, carbon plus oxygen equals zero. And if carbon, if the oxygen is negative two, then the only, the, the math tells us that the carbon has to be positive too if we follow the algebra. We can do the same thing for the hypochlorite ion. Chlorine plus oxygen is equal to the negative one charge on the ion. And if the oxygen is negative two, then the chlorine must be positive one. Are we together so far? Okay, on the other side, I've got the carbonate ion. Carbonate, I have carbon and I have three oxygens. Total charge is negative two. If each of those oxygens is negative two, because again, oxygen is almost always negative two. Carbon plus negative six is equal to negative two. Carbon must be positive four. Now, what about the chlorine here? It is zero. Chlorine, in this case, is representing its elemental state. Elements in their natural state, they have an oxidation state of zero. The other way that we can think about this, again, algebraically, Cl2, so that means two times chlorine is equal to zero. Well, algebraically, zero divided by two is still zero. Remember, if I have multiple atoms of the same element in a compound or in an ion, all of those atoms have to have the same oxidation state. You can't have multiple states in the same compound for the same atom unless we're talking about, we did an example of an ionic compound that had two different sets of nitrogens and the nitrogens in the cation were one state and the nitrogens in the anion were the other state. That we handle a little bit differently because the ions are separate from each other. They're only held together electrostatically. They're not held together covalently. But, that's not something that we need to worry about. That was, that was a class example, the, the oxidation problem on the exam's not that complicated. What we do need to identify, our first question here, is this a redox reaction? And to answer that question, we have to understand, we have to know what are the conditions of a redox reaction? How could I identify one? Let 
Why did we go through all this business with the oxidation numbers? Right. That's what we're looking for. If the numbers change, then it's a redox reaction because that means that some, some of these atoms have lost electrons and others have gained electrons. And by that very definition, that is oxidation when we lose and reduction when we gain. If we don't have that, then we know we're not dealing with redox. We're dealing with something else. So the question again is, is this redox? Well, what are we looking for? We're looking for changes in the oxidation states. And we can see the carbon has changed and the chlorine has changed. So we have experienced changes in the oxidation states. So yes, this is an oxidation reaction. This is a redox. Now, these questions were not asked in this practice on this version of the exam, but they were asked in your quiz. What was the element oxidized? And what was the element reduced? Even though they're not explicitly asked for here, they are gonna help with those last two questions. So which element was oxidized here? not the chlorine. It's the carbon. You know, say it to yourself, loss of electrons is oxidation. Gain of electrons is reduction. Lee Ogre. Loss of electrons would mean we are getting more positive in charge less negative in charge. Gain of electrons would mean we are getting more negative, or if there is no negative to be found, we're getting less positive. And so we can see that the carbon is getting more positive, less negative, that's oxidation. We can see that the chlorine is getting more negative, less positive, that's the reduction. One of the most common mistakes made on the quiz yesterday was overdoing it, taking it too far. If we ask you for an element, give us an element. Don't give us a compound. Don't give us an ion. We're looking just for the element. And that being said, now that we're looking at oxidizing and reducing agents, now you give us the compounds. Now you give us the ions because that's what matters. So with these in mind, what is the oxidizing agent? It is, it's a hypochloride ion. How do I know that? Because inside of that hypochloride ion, is the chlorine that got reduced. So that is the substance that forced the oxidation of the carbon. And what is the reducing agent? Well, it's what's left, the carbon monoxide. Cannot stress this enough. In these kinds of problems, the correct answer is never on the right-hand side of the equation. Now, I stressed it very, very much at the time when we covered in lecture. And I still had a number of you give, it, give products as the, the answer there. It's not the answer. If I'm looking for redox action, 
yes, the reactant and product side have to be compared to identify oxidation, to identify reduction. But beyond that, all of these sub questions are all asking about reactants. All right, further questions on this example. Do we want to do another do it do we want to do another example problem? Okay. So let's go back to our whiteboard here. And again, I'll just make one up here and we'll see where it goes. Something along those lines, yes. Um, the chart's really just an organizational kind of tool just to kind of, because I've done it in the past where I say assign all oxidation numbers and you inevitably forget something. Um, so just trying to help you figure out what you need to put in your answer. All right, let's look at got iron two plus reacting with um, chromate ion to make iron three plus and Chromic oxide. So you go on a slightly simpler route. There aren't as many things to consider here, but let's look at the oxidation states for the iron, the chromium, and the oxygen on each side since at least in this unbalanced equation each of those only appears in one of the reactants or one of the products Yes. Okay. So for iron two plus here, this is an ion. It has a charge. Now, because it doesn't have anything else with it, it just so happens that the charge and the oxidation state are the same. So on the reactant side here, the iron's oxidation state is positive two. On the product side, the iron's oxidation state is positive three. So that rule about the sum of the oxidation numbers equaling the total charge, it applies here as well to these monatomic ions. So if I have any kind of ion that is just a single element, I can use it in this kind of way. All right, looking at the chromate, I've got chromium and four oxygens equaling out to a total charge of negative two. Now, what do we know about oxygen? It's gonna be negative two. So if I have four negative twos, then that means that this is a negative eight in total. Chromium must be a positive six in this case.
On the other side, we've already covered the iron because it was monatomic, it's positive three. We're gonna do the same kind of thing, two chromiums plus three oxygens. This is uncharged, so zero there. Again, we've got oxygen in a compound, so its state's gonna be negative two. So two chromium is equal to positive six, which means chromium would be positive three there. So let's run through those questions yet again. Is this a redox reaction? Absolutely. We can clearly see that the iron and the chromium have changed states. Which element was oxidized? It is iron. Again, if you have to say it to yourself each time, say it to yourself. The loss of electrons is oxidation. The gain of electrons is reduction. Iron is going from a less positive to more positive state. So it has lost an electron. Chromium is getting from a more positive to less positive state. So it has gained electrons. So the chromium was reduced. What are my oxidizing and reducing agents? So now's the time where we can block off that second half of the reaction because it's not relevant to those two questions. I've got two options. It's either the iron two plus ion or the chromate ion. Which one's the oxidizing agent? The chromate. And the reducing agent is the iron two plus ion. And again, it's important to recognize that the reactants as a whole are what need to be represented in this question. I can't just simply turn it around and say chromium was the oxidizing agent and iron was the reducing agent. That's not specific enough. It has to be the chromate ion. It has to be the iron two ion because those are the actual reactant participants here. All right, let's move on to something else. So let's open it back up for question again. Okay. okay, number five has a little bit of everything. It's one of the reasons why I chose it for the practice. We are told that we have a 12.36 gram sample of copper metal and that it requires 18.92 milliliters of nitric acid to react completely. 
First, we need to balance it. Then we need to determine the concentration of the nitric acid. And then we need to do a stoichiometry problem about the nitrogen dioxide. So again, a little bit of everything in this, which is a good way to practice multiple concepts at the same time. So let's start with the balancing piece. Now, as far as balancing is concerned, this one's actually a little bit of a toughie just because we've got a couple of extra pieces and parts in here. Um, so if I was looking at nitrate alone, I would be looking at, okay, well, I need two of those, but I've got this nitrogen dioxide here as well. So that creates another nitrogen to, to, to work on and worry about. So this one kind of requires a little bit of trial and error, but what we have to kind of break even on is we know that the number that's going to be in this spot here is going to be an even number. And the reason we know that is because that number of hydrogens can only be even. So from that standpoint, the easiest way to solve this balancing wise is just trial and error. And with trial and error, what we end up doing is we know that two is not the correct answer. So let's go up to four and see what happens. If I put a four here with the nitric acid. That means I'm going to need four hydrogens. So I need two waters. And I've already got my nitrates here, two of them. So that means I would need two nitrogen dioxides to give us four nitrogens in total. And it just so happens, that's all we needed to do. If I take it all the way here, I've got one copper, I've got four hydrogens, four nitrogens, 12 oxygens. And over here, one copper, two nitrogens here plus two more is four, six oxygens here, plus four here and two more is 12. Six plus four plus two. And we already balanced out the hydrogens as well. So I will tell you confidently, one of the reasons I chose this particular one was because at the time I wrote this exam, you were required to balance the equations in that copper lab that you did. And this is one of the copper lab questions. So there was some familiarity with it that was hopefully something that came through at the time. The, there is a question on, to, on the exam where you will have to balance an equation and then go from there it's not quite this complicated. It's a little bit more straightforward of a balancing as far as that's concerned. So we've done part A, we've balanced it. Now we need to determine the concentration of the nitric acid. Now for the concentration of nitric acid, we need moles of HNO3, divided by liters of HNO3 solution. Now we already have one of those components already. We know how much volume it was. We just need to convert the milliliters into liters. We can do that by dividing by 1000, which gives us 0 0.01892 liters.
Now we need to find the number of moles of nitric acid. But luckily we've been given some data that should help us. This is the stoichiometry aspect of this question. Twelve point three six grams of copper. I need to turn the grams of copper into moles. For that, I need my periodic table. One mole of copper has sixty three point five five grams in it. And now that I have my balanced chemical equation, the conversion between moles of copper and moles of nitric acid comes directly from that equation, four nitric acids for one copper. And since that's where I need to stop, because that's what I need for the calculation, that's where I'm gonna stop. 12.36 divided or multiplied by four, divided by 63.55 to four significant figures would give 0 0.7780 moles of nitric acid. If I divide that by my 0 0.01892 liters of solution, I get an absurdly large 41.12 molar nitric acid. Now, this particular value is actually impossible to acquire. Concentrated nitric acid is somewhere around 18 molar. This is nearly three times that. Um, so this is what I get for creating a problem without consulting a textbook. Um, uh, Cause I did make this one on my own. Nonetheless, doesn't matter. That's the process that you would undertake. So this one doesn't even really qualify as solution stoichiometry. You can take it that direction. But really at the end, you've got moles of nitric acid. So this is just classic stoichiometry right here. The only difference is that instead of stopping at grams, we've divided by a volume to get a concentration. All right, any questions about part B before we look at part C? Okay, so um, for the purposes of keeping this balanced chemical equation in our line of sight, I'm going to solve this problem above the question as opposed to below it. This is a classic stoichiometry question. There's no solution stoichiometry whatsoever here because we're talking and starting with a mass of copper. 19.45 grams. And we want to convert it to a mass of gas. So nothing here is in solution. We don't have to worry about any of that chapter eight solution molarity stuff. 
We can just solve this one directly like we did in chapter seven. So starting with the same, with this 19.45 grams of copper, we're gonna go through the traditional three-step process to convert grams of one substance to grams of another using stoichiometry. Grams of copper get turned into moles. Moles of copper get turned into moles of nitrogen dioxide, excuse me. Moles of nitrogen dioxide get turned into grams of nitrogen dioxide. This format should look familiar to you because you did it about 600 times in chapter seven. Now we just need to fill in the correct numbers in the right places. We've already established in the previous problem that the molar mass of copper is 63.55 grams per mole. That's gonna get my grams of copper to cancel out. Using the balanced chemical equation, I can see that for every one mole of copper, there are two moles of nitrogen dioxide. That will make my moles of copper cancel out. Last thing is the molar mass of nitrogen dioxide. Every mole of that stuff gives me 14.01 for nitrogen, 16 for each oxygen, and there are two of them. Grand total 46.01 grams of nitrogen dioxide per mole. My moles cancel. Nineteen point four five times two times forty six point oh one divided by sixty three point five five to four significant figures would be 28.16 grams of nitrogen dioxide. All right, so any questions about part C here? No. Okay, so the 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 key word Okay. Right. Right. And so the key word there is excess, exactly what you said. When we are told something is in excess, that means that we can automatically throw out any limiting reactant kind of problems that we're going to do. Because if we've already identified one of the components as excess, that means that by default, the other reactant is the limiting reactant. And since the limiting reactant determines how much product there is, that's where we can start. So the identification of the nitric acid as excess just means that it's not gonna factor into our calculation. So it didn't matter that it was 41 molar. We had way too much of it anyway. What mattered was that we had 19.45 grams of copper and we were gonna try to figure out how much nitrogen dioxide we would make from that. So that's a key word to look for on the exam, if you see something that is identified as excess, that means that we've already kind of concluded it's not the limiting reactant. And because of that, you're not gonna do very much with anything about it in terms of stoichiometry.
All right, other questions about this practice problem? All right, well, just for the sake of completion here, and because it is similar, let's take a look at number four. Now, number four has no solution component to it, but it is stoichiometry and limiting reactants. So it does fit kind of with what we were talking about in the previous problem. So once again, we start with a chemical equation. And again, we need to balance it. What kind of chemical reaction is this? Okay, how can you tell now? Okay, fair enough. Um, combustion reactions will always have oxygen as a reactant. And the majority of them have carbon dioxide and water as products. That's how we can identify combustion. Now, one other little thing about combustion reactions is that they are sometimes kind of tricky to, to solve. What it's gonna come down to again is that even odd thing I was trying to explain in the, um, in the previous problem. Because oxygens can only come in pairs, we know that the coefficient on the water here has to be even. And so that's where we're going to kind of run into if we do that coefficient trick that I taught you when we were doing balancing equations, you would look at this and say, okay, I need four carbon dioxides and five waters to give me 10 hydrogens right away you should be going oh wait 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 that's going to give me an odd number of oxygens that can't work now what we also talked about at that time is when you get in that situation the easiest way to get out of it is to double everything so if you double everything there The one in front of the carbon compound is now a two. The four in front of the carbon dioxide is now an eight. The five in front of the water is now a 10. And with that, all that's left is the oxygen. I've got eight times two, 16 oxygens in carbon dioxide, 10 more from the water, 16 and 10 is 26. 26 divided by two is 13. There's my balanced chemical equation. So part one, check. Part two, determine the limiting reactant. Now, I will tell you as a hint overall, make sure that you read all parts of these kinds of questions. Because usually I've set it up in some kind of way that you can do a two for one somewhere in here. So if you remember the process for determining limiting reactants, you know that we have to take each of those reactants and convert them into a product and compare the products to each other to figure out which one runs out first. If I look at letter D, letter D tells me I need to calculate the theoretical yield of water. But water is a product. So why don't I do both at the same time? Convert both of them to water, use the water masses to figure out which one runs out. And the one that's the limiting reactant also tells us the yield of the water in the process. I just answered two of the questions 
doing one set of calculations saves us time. There's always something like that in there in these long multi-section problems with stoichiometry. There's always something like that there. Usually it's because I'm trying to see who's paying attention. Who's been paying attention? Who's been listening? Who's taking time out of their day to watch this on YouTube later? Those are the things that usually show up that you can use that are helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So starting with the 1,015 grams of butane. Process very similar to what we did in the previous problem. We got to go grams to moles. Moles of butane to moles of water. And then finally, the molar mass of water. For butane, Carbon is 12.01 and there are four of them. Hydrogen is 1.01 and there are 10 of them. One mole of butane is 58.14 grams. My grams cancel. Balanced chemical equation tells us that it is a 10 to two ratio of water to butane. So butane moles cancel out. And you probably know this one off the top of your head already. 18.02 grams of water in a mole. If you didn't, water is 16, hydrogen is 1.01, .01, and there are two of them. One thousand fifteen times 10 times 18.02. Divide by 58.14, divide by two to four significant figures is 1,728 grams of water. We're going to do the same process, 965 grams of oxygen, going through the same series of conversions. Grams of oxygen to moles, moles of oxygen to moles of water, moles of water to grams. Luckily, these ones are a little bit easier. One mole of oxygen is 32.00 grams, so my grams of oxygen cancel. The ratio of water to oxygen is 10 to 13. So my moles of oxygen cancel. Molar mass is exactly the same. 18.02 to one. And again, this should be something noticeable. One of the most common mistakes made in limiting reactant problems is forgetting to compare the same things. I've seen it done far too many times where one of the calculations will convert to grams of water and another one will convert it to grams of carbon dioxide. And you make the comparison and you choose the correct one based on the numbers and you get partial credit but you really didn't do it correctly. Or the one that you chose ends up being incorrect. Every subsequent problem afterward is incorrect. And you end up doing way poorer than you should. The important thing here is we need to compare direct to direct. Grams of water to grams of water.
It's got to be the same thing or else the comparison makes no sense. 965 times 10 times 18.02 divided by 32 divided by 13 to three significant figures is 418 grams of water. So just a slight difference between the two. That 418 grams of water, since it has been used to identify the limiting reactant as oxygen, we also know that that 418 grams of water, that is our theoretical yield. Now, how do we go about answering the other two questions on this list? The calculation of the leftover mass and the percent yield. Well, we'll start with the percent yield because that one's kind of the most direct to what we've been doing. Remember, percent yield is actual yield over theoretical yield times 100%. We are told the actual yield is 375.9 grams. And we just calculated the theoretical yield at 418 grams. So if I take that ratio, multiply it by 100%. So three significant figures, I get an 89.9% yield. Now, as far as this other question goes, it's actually pretty straightforward. It just requires a different kind of thinking. It's a stoichiometry problem as well. But before we get into the stoichiometry, we have to figure out how much extra there is. To figure out the amount of extra, 1,728 grams of water minus the 418 that actually formed. would give us 1,310 grams of water in excess. Now that 1,310 grams of water isn't real. It's never gonna form, but we're gonna use it as a starting point to figure out how much butane didn't react based on how much water it would have made had it reacted. So we're going to basically go backwards here. 1,310 grams of water. We're going to turn the grams of water into moles. We're going to turn the moles of water into moles of butane, since that was our excess at reactant. We're going to turn the moles of butane into grams. Now, the reason I left this stuff up here was to give us a guide. Because you'll notice the calculation that we did to determine the limiting reactant is basically the reciprocal, the flipped over and reversed fraction for what we're being asked to do right now. All of the steps are there. They're just in reverse. They're, they're backwards and upside down. One mole of 
Water is 18.02 grams. Two moles of butane for every 10 of water. One mole of butane is 58.14 grams. Again, we've taken each one of these fractions and we've turned it on its head and we've put them in reverse order. Now that we've done that, 1310 times two times 58.14 divided by 18.02 divided by 10 would give us 845.3 grams of butane left over. So we started with 1115. We're ending with just over 845. Gives you an idea of just how little actually reacted um, as far as the butane is concerned. But for a problem like this, if you were asked to figure out the excess, that's all that you do. You take your limiting reactant data, you subtract to figure out the difference, and then you run it back backwards and try to figure out what was left over of the other reactant. If you make a mistake, it'll be easy to pick up the mistake because if you make a mistake and you choose the wrong reactant, for example, let's say that you went and did this for the oxygen instead of the butane. The net result that you would get wouldn't make sense in the context of where you started. In this particular case, it would tell you that you had more excess than the amount that you started with in the first place. In other circumstances, it would just it, the, the numbers would come out funky and you would realize, oh, maybe I, maybe I went to the wrong react. Any questions about this stoichiometry problem? Okay, this is what I was saying before. You technically could do either one. The reason we chose water was because a later question asked for water. And so we saved ourselves a little bit of time by not having to do this calculation in addition to the other two calculations. And so usually on those kinds of problems, there's going to be something like that woven in to help guide you. Okay, technically you could choose either one of these products, but if you choose this one, it also answers this question later. It's one less calculation you have to do. But you are right. You could have done the limiting reactant and figured out carbon dioxide and compared them there. The only difference was you would have had to do this calculation here at the bottom to answer letter B because that wouldn't have been something you had already calculated. All right, we've got time for one, maybe two more questions. Anybody else have things that you want to cover? Anything from the multiple choice stand out as particularly troublesome? Okay.
Okay, for 14, you're trying to identify iodine that has an oxidation state of positive three. Now, what you should recognize in each of these is that all of these are ionic compounds in some kind of way. So what you're really looking at, you're not looking at the hydrogen. Um, if you did, it wouldn't make that big of a difference because hydrogen in each of these cases would be positive one. But what you're looking for is I need, I need some version of hydrogen, iodine, oxygen that gives me zero where this is positive three. Well, if hydrogen's positive one and iodine's positive three, that means that the oxygens have to be negative four in total to get us to zero. Okay, so that's kind of the cheater's code for that kind of question is don't worry about solving all of it, break it down in a different way. I know oxygen is always going to be negative two. How many negative twos do I need to solve this problem? In this case, it's two. Otherwise, you'd have to go through this individually and go IO4 negative is e So iodine times four oxygens is equal to negative one. This is negative eight. So the iodine is positive seven. Okay, that's not right. It, you, you, you could do it another way. Obviously, it would be slower. Like I said, you can almost think of this like a cheat code. Um, it's just a different way of looking at the problem. It works. Right? Right, other questions? In the mobile choice. Yeah. yeah, so um, number six is a trick question of sorts. You expect the answer to be water because water is the solvent for pretty much every solution. Got to remember your definitions though. By definition, the solvent is the substance that is present in the greatest molar amount. And so if I have 96 grams of sulfuric acid and only four grams of water, sulfuric acid is present in the greatest molar amount. It is technically the solvent. Now, in normal language, would we use it that way? No, but again, this question is there to see who knows their definitions and who is just assuming things based upon kind of conventional wisdom. So yes, the answer there is B. Um, yes, you, I mean, that would be the way to do it. Usually you can tell by the masses and more often than not, a question like this would have a, a disparity in it. You know, generally speaking for an aqueous solution, 
you're going to assume water is the solvent unless we have a situation like this where it is so tilted in the direction of the other substance that's in there in that case then you go okay wait a second that's that's really concentrated maybe maybe water isn't the solvent in that case um but ordinarily ordinarily water is going to be your solvent and honestly think about it from my perspective the only reason i would include a question like that would be honestly just again see who who really knows what they're talking about and who's paying attention and who's just making assumptions so i'm not saying i put this one in that particular exam to trick you but I was kind of trying to figure out, there are some questions that are in exams that are really trying to just see, okay, who are the students who are gonna get A's and B's in this class? And who are the students who are not? The ones that are in the A and B category usually get this question right. The ones who are not usually miss this question. Sure. Which of the following would behave as a weak electrolyte in water? Okay, so remember, when it comes to electrolytes, they usually fall into the non-electrolyte category, which means no ions whatsoever. And then with the strong electrolyte, weak electrolyte, it comes down to strength versus solubility. For salts, it's all about solubility. If it's soluble, it's strong. If it's not soluble, it's nothing. For acids and bases, it comes down to strength because they are dissolved how much do they break apart when they do dissolve? So the strong ones are strong electrolytes. The weak ones are weak electrolytes. So when you're given a problem like this, and it's asking specifically about a weak electrolyte, your brain should automatically go to weak acids and weak bases. Those are the only two things that fit into that category. So from that perspective, I can eliminate three of the answers sodium nitrate it's a salt copper two sulfate it's a salt ammonium chloride it's a salt those three salts are going to be soluble in water they're going to be strong electrolytes and even if they were insoluble they wouldn't be weak electrolytes they'd be non-electrolytes so if it's a salt it doesn't belong in the weak category so now I got to compare barium hydroxide and ammonia. Now, from a recognition standpoint, you should recognize, okay, barium hydroxide, barium's in the bottom of group two. Group two has all of our strong bases in it, along with group one. So there's a strong base there. So if I eliminate that answer, all that's left is ammonia. Well, wait a second. Ammonia is not a hydroxide until we put it into water and then it becomes ammonium hydroxide. And ammonium hydroxide is like the commonest of the common weak bases. It's the one we always talk about. So again, a little bit of a trickeration there, but not so much because again, you should recognize that ammonia in the form of ammonium hydroxide is, is a weak base. And so that's where that in water part really comes in. What happens to ammonia when we put it into water? It comes together, it makes ammonium hydroxide, 
the ammonium hydroxide is the weak base that we're looking for. All right, we've got time for one more. All right, Hope. Okay. All right, classic dilution equation problem here. Now, just as a word of note and warning, a question like this will not be in the multiple choice section. I generally don't put calculation questions in the multiple choice with the exception of maybe something like uh, one of the ones there was like calculate the molar mass of something. Now, the reason this is in the review, the reason I had it originally on one of my exams was preparation for the final exam where those kinds of questions will be asked. But generally, I tend to keep concept kind of questions in the multiple choice because you've got enough calculation stuff to worry about on in the, the, the free response section. That said, we're told we have commercial hydrochloric acid at 12.1 molar. We want to know how much of it we're going to need to use to make 250 milliliters of a three molar solution. The equation here that we're using is the dilution equation. M1V1 is equal to M2V2. This does look familiar because this is the titration equation without the chemical reaction part, without the denominator. Our initial volume is 12.1 molar. We're trying to figure out the volume. The initial, or excuse me, the final molarity is three. The final volume is 250 milliliters. If I divide each side by 12.1 molar, my molarities cancel out. Three times 250 divided by 12.1 to three significant figures gives me 62.0 milliliters. So if we find ourselves in a situation where we are being asked to make a less concentrated solution from a more concentrated one, the dilution equation would work in that circumstance. Now, just as a word of note, if you were making solutions in the lab, for example, and you needed to take a concentrated solution to make a more dilute solution, this is exactly how you would do that. This is exactly how you calculate what you needed. And then you would just take a pipette or a burette measure out the exact amount, put it into a volumetric flask or something and dilute it, get, get it to where it's supposed to be. So that's where I'm going to stop us for today, primarily because I'm starting to lose my voice. Um, if you have more questions as they come up, I do have an office hour tomorrow at one o'clock. I will be in my lab, uh, that's lab 301 from eight to 11 and from two to five. So at the same time that you are in lab, the 105 lab, lab 310, I'm in 301 with the 106 students. So if you wanna pop over and ask a question um, during that time, feel free to do so as well. Um, but that's all I got for you. Thanks for coming. Really, I do mean it, I appreciate it. Um, and I will see you on Friday, if not sooner.